don't know about you, but at the beginning of this episode, Mark was giving me baby shark energy. Yeah. Do you like calamari? Mm. Oysters? No. Wait, what do you eat? Clearly goldfish. You will expand your palate. Sorry to all the parents who finally got that song out of their mind. It's back. Hello everybody and welcome back to Taste of Reality. My name is Queenie for those who don't know me and we're reviewing Married at First Sight season 14 episode 4. Before I get into it, please make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. This episode was a doozy so mm, let's get into it. So we're gonna start with the couple that had the most positive experience during this episode, and that's Noi and Steve. Before I actually talk about their relationship, what was this breakfast? What was this? I felt like this was food you give to a rabbit. Where's, where's the sustenance? Okay, it, it was very much so lacking. So Steve listened to Noi's brother's advice and allowed himself to get a little physical with Noi by giving her kisses and cuddling her through the night. So that was good. Steve's dad appreciated that Noi upholds some traditional values and he really liked that she wore the, I'm gonna call it regala because I don't know what it's actually called, at the wedding and that she had something for Steve as well. She got emotional at the table just because, you know, she's been through a lot when it comes to love and the parents reassure her that, listen, you got a good one. As long as you're honest with him, he will be honest with you. So the job topic comes up at both tables and we know Noi is a little bit more flexible when it comes to it, but her family? Oh, her family was not having it. You know, different people have different expectations for what they want out of life. What do you want out of life? I want grandkids. What's a baby? Yeah, yeah. If you can have a baby, you have to have a job first. Realistically, anybody would look at the situation and, you know, pause for concern because this is a cause for concern. Um, you're going into a marriage not having financial stability, which doesn't mean you don't have money, but you don't have a for sure, you know, source of income that you can 100% rely on. Freelance work is great, but if something happens to it, you're at a loss. You know what I mean? Um, they reconvene, being uh, Noi and Steve, and they talk about the job thing. And she's saying, um, well, I understand your situation, but it's important that you have a job. And his response is, well, we can talk about where we wanna go so that I can see what I can um, commit to full time. Steve, if you have a wife and she's trying to plan y'all's life, I mean, personally, I'm more of a traditional person when it comes to marriage, so it shouldn't even be that way to begin with, but that's where we are. How can she make a plan without anything solid? How can she make a plan saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do in the future, and then you are gonna be like, okay, now I can commit to something. No, commit to something, and then let's see what we can make happen with the circumstance we've created for ourselves. Like, Steve, you're one of my favorite husbands. What's going on, boo? What's happening, babes? But um, yeah, for the most part, they do understand each other. They do seem to be flexible with each other so let's hope that it stays good the honeymoon they were giving great great energy she's smitten by him and he is smitten by her and it's very cute to see especially because the farther we go down on this list of couples it's about to get a little messy up next we have michael and jasmina jasmina explains to michael why the dad was saying and i'm just gonna say mom and dad instead of stepmom stepdad because her real parents, they're just not in the picture anyways. So we're just gonna say mom and dad. The, uh, the dad um, had said he doesn't want somebody who's weak and he also doesn't want somebody who bullies her. And she explains that in the past, she was with somebody who wouldn't fight with her. What, is that what she said? No, she said she had an ex that wouldn't argue with her. Uh, must he 
argue with you. Maybe she meant like he didn't really stand his ground sometimes or he would be a yes man. He would be too compromising. That I could maybe understand. But using the verbiage like he wouldn't argue with me makes you sound like you're combative. And I don't think that's quite the case with her, but I don't know. It, it kind of seemed like the case further, further down. His sisters, um, the next day she's talking to the family and his sisters emphasize that he can be pessimistic. Not really a good uh, <laughs> characteristic to share with a new partner and that he tends to overthink. Michael always like assumes the worst. He doesn't expect worse, but he always assumes it first mm -hmm. so that he doesn't like, I don't know, over anticipate the outcome or something. So he's always like, okay, it's not gonna go well, just so he's not disappointed. I mean, we did see this at the bachelor party where he was so stressed about the possible outcomes of what could happen rather than taking in the environment that he was in. It's your last day of singledom, have fun, let loose, like release your inhibitions, just enjoy yourself. And instead he's creating all these scenarios that he has no idea you know, whether or not they're gonna come to fruition. Why tarnish a good time focusing on things that may never come to pass, you know? Um, later on, he's having a conversation with Jasmina's mother and she's very protective, you can tell. And um, the mom asks Michael, what are some examples you have of marriage? Which I thought, great question. He says uh, he comes from a family where marriage wasn't, a reality for them and having lost his family he had to hold on to his um having lost his parents sorry he had to hold on to his sisters and his aunts and the female presence in his life makes him think that like it makes up for the lack of a marriage representative yeah, y'all know what I'm saying. His representation of marriage wasn't there, but he makes up for it in having women in his life. Yes, here we are. Um, Another pause for concern, because yes, it is great. I feel personally, it's great when a man is exposed to a lot of feminine energy because he learns different he has different insights than another person would if they're surrounded by a lot of testosterone if they're surrounded by just men or just broken marriages like it's great that he has women around but the image of marriage tends to have a fairy tale type image i don't really see that being the case with michael specifically because he's an overthinker but you see some people trying to overcompensate for the lack of a good marriage representation that they almost have these unrealistic expectations of what marriage should look like. Hopefully we're all together here. Um, the conflict near the end of the episode between Ola and, um, what's the white lady's name? Lindsay brings up the difference in how Michael and Jasmina see adversity. So his argument is that conflict is inevitable when you have people who don't know each other in the same space. Her argument is as long as boundaries are respected, as long as you have decorum, there is no need for conflict to happen. Like, don't say that it's inevitable. If it happens, fine, but don't expect it. Don't anticipate it, right? And his rebuttal was, well, you don't know people's boundaries and all this stuff. Honestly, I understand where both of them are coming from in the fact that, yes, conflict is inevitable when you're dealing with anybody. Doesn't matter how similar you are, doesn't matter how different you are. Conflict is almost always inevitable. But to anticipate it, is a problem because you're moving in a you're moving in a manner that's defensive and that's not a good way to to handle things in life you know don't don't have your guard up with someone and just think like oh we're go we're going to have a fight because we don't know each other we're going to argue we're going to disagree because we're not used to each other's boundaries we don't know each other's you know buttons why must conflict be inevitable you know, and because she's a no nonsense kind of person and because he's an overthinker, I'm pretty, pretty sure their heads are going to bud very quickly. It's looking like the next episode, everybody's heads are budding. So, yeah, 
it's going to be interesting to see how these two work through adversity. Okay, so up next is Alyssa and Chris. And even though I don't want to talk to them, I have the most notes about them. I'm going to try to speed past them because they honestly bore me. But here we go. Alyssa says that she was put off by what the friends said about Chris at the wedding. When in reality, oh, he also said something in the elevator about being her side piece. It was a joke, girl. Lighten up. In reality, he had said this on the after party that the whole night he was fighting for her attention and she gave none. She was not willing to pay him any mind. She didn't want to talk to him. She didn't want to interact with him. And so he felt like he had to just make sure that she was uncomfortable she was comfortable because she was coming off very uncomfortable. And so they spoke that night and she said, the vibe, the vibe between us is just off. There's just too many differences. I think there's a lot of things that we don't have in common. I think our hobbies are extremely different. I think the, the way we would live our everyday life is very different. Realistically, she's been looking for something to go wrong as soon as she laid eyes on him. As soon as she realized that she wasn't going to get what she had been hoping for, she was looking for the nearest exit. Here's my issue. Somebody in, in the comments in the last video was like, um, don't diminish how important physical attraction is. 1000% I'm not diminishing the importance of physical attraction. But if you're going to come on a show where people that you don't know are choosing a partner that you don't know, you don't have the right to be picky about physical appearance in the sense that it shouldn't be weighted more than the person's character. You know what I mean? And she didn't allow for his character to shine through. She immediately was guarded. She immediately was shut off when the appearance wasn't what she anticipated. And to me, that's an issue. You're coming in a situation where you let other people legally bind you to somebody you don't no, character should be of the utmost importance to you. And you're so stuck on physicality and then you wanna make up these other excuses for why it's not gonna work. Girl, you're lying. You're a liar. I'm not gonna be pressed over this woman. I don't know her. <laughs> I do not know her. So Alyssa's family is really trying to smooth things over for Chris and to me, I got the impression that they know she's hard to deal with. Maybe it'll just take time. Yeah. She's always been very particular with guys, and so I think she's being a little rash. I don't know why Chris is still being so lenient. He was saying, you know, if she gives even just 1%, then I'm going to give it a try. Your threshold is 1%? I'm telling you, my threshold of effort is 60 because I need you to be just over halfway. And I know that's technically 51%, but I need 60 because we can work up to 80 because, you know, then the 80, 20 rule, all of that stuff, whatever. We're not here for math class. My point is 1% is not enough effort. 1% is basically zero. 1% is basically zero. Chris, I need you to get it together. <laughs> 1%? 1%. No, baby. No. When they reconvene, um, she, well, actually, even before that, she had nothing to say to the family. Like, it was very awkward. Um, she's under the impression that she's a happy, not happy, she's an open person. Don't know who told her that. Don't know what gave her that perception of herself. But um, introspection is something that you could probably work through in therapy. So when they reconvene, she's talking about... Um, being excited, spending time with the other couples, being excited, getting to know the other people. And so Chris was trying to give different activities that they could do. And she shut every single one of them down until she said, oh, I like the beach. And then he's like, okay, we'll do the beach. Now her issue is he's a yes man. What else is the man supposed to do? At every opportunity you get, you shut him down. You tell him no. You give an excuse to why something can't happen. So of course, when I see a crack in the door, I'm going to try to break it down. You said, you said there's a chance. I'm going with the chance. But now that's an issue too. 
I can't stand this woman. I cannot stand this woman. At the honeymoon, she says that she feels gypped. Um, basically shortchanged. Um, she sees too many differences between them and she feels very uncomfortable sharing a suite with a stranger. Again, I ask why sign up for this experiment? You're uncomfortable sharing a room with a stranger? The bed? Okay. I can let the bed slide sometimes. Uh, nah, I'm not going to get into my personal life, but I get it. The suite? Homeboy could have slept on the couch, on the floor, whatever. But to say, I don't even want to be in the same room with you because you're a stranger. He was always going to be a stranger. Okay, move on, move on, girl, move on. Um, she proceeds to misconstrue his words by saying he's calling me a liar, saying that I'm uncomfortable sleeping in the same room. No, honey. He said he thinks you're lying about the fact that you you have put an effort in this marriage, which is true. You haven't put effort in this marriage. As soon as you turn that corner, you shut down. So effort has not been put in. Not a single ounce of effort has been put in at all. So anyways, that's the end of, oh no, that's not the end. There's one more note. She felt like he was spreading bad things about her to her family. When really he was just recounting the fact that she said she thinks they're better off as friends. You see, you can't trust a woman like this, yeah? You can't trust a woman who hears what she wants to hear and runs with the negative. No, 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 I'm done with her. She could leave, leave the process, we're good. All right, so we're gonna move on to Mark and Lindsay. They both share their history with their mom being that Lindsay's mom wants nothing to do with her. And, and honestly, the, the things that she said, well, she didn't go into what the mom said in the email, but the fact that the mom sent an email to somebody else about Lindsay, yo, that's next level. She actually didn't tell me she wasn't gonna come. She sent an email to somebody saying, I'm probably not gonna come to the wedding and talked really badly about me in the email. And I was like, just don't come. Mark shares that his mom has severe depression. And I mean, how could you not? Losing your husband abruptly like that, like, I'm sure there was other stuff that um, added to her mental health, um, to her mental state, let's say. But losing somebody, losing your life partner, that'll do it. That will do it. Um, hopefully they don't, Okay, let me try it softly when I say this. I was gonna say hopefully they don't trauma bond, but I don't think there's an issue with relating with somebody based on their trauma, but I hope that they don't think that like the deficit that they have will be filled by the person because ultimately you do have to deal with that whether the person is there or not. We're just gonna speed past that because this is not a therapy session for you guys, but we're moving on. Um, when Lindsay was speaking to Mark's family, it almost sounded like He's immature. Mark the shark, MTS. That chapter might be closing now. No, no, I'm Mrs. I mean, MTS. Yeah. <laughs> I already took it all. Right, he can take the name, yeah. but I mean, like, you know, open up. And he does wear his heart on his sleeve. He trusts everybody, almost like to a fault. Same. The way the family is so concerned about him being too trusting, him having his heart on his sleeve, him being caught up on his college <laughs> nickname, um, Mark the shark paints the picture to me that he needs to grow. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm reading that wrong, but that's the image that I received. I loved that Lindsay's family gave Mark a survival kit, basically saying like, hey, these are the things that can really mitigate conflict between you guys. Um, but then it also made me feel like she needed to grow too, because the dad, the dad is very clear on saying, listen, her tongue is sharp. So be careful. And the friends were saying, you need to tell her no, because she doesn't hear it enough. That sounds like somebody who needs to be raised, if you ask me. Why, why did these two sign? Okay, it's okay, girl. It's okay, it's all right. That's their marriage, not yours. Um, we're gonna talk about their conflict with Ola and Katina after I address Ola and Katina. 
So for some reason, Katina's under the impression that Ola is going to be willing to wait to consummate the marriage. Um, where'd you get that from? Look at me, is she beautiful? Hurry up, baby, hurry up. The best way for you, baby. Yeah. Okay, so they do get very cozy the night of the wedding, which is cute. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And throughout the episode, she went from saying she wanted to wait a month to being okay with consummating during the honeymoon. Girl, don't let her sweet talk you, okay? Keep your guard up. Especially with Ola. I would hold on to that. I would hold on to that for as long as possible. <laughs> I really would. I don't know. Something about him. I'm like, I, I really need to know that you're in here for the long haul before I give you this cool cat. A pro that I will give to Ola is that he was very open with sharing his past when it comes to women, and it encouraged her to share her past as a party girl. Normally, this is something that a partner has to coax out of the person, so the way that he was um, so willing to share that information, he was forthright with it. Hopefully, is him putting it to rest. Hopefully, I know the narrative they're trying to paint about him is that he could be stuck in the playboy mindset. So I'm just hoping that they're just putting that on the loop and that he's truly let that go. So Ola's mom didn't really have much to give us on screen. I don't know if they talked more, um, but basically she was letting Katina know that she's relinquishing her cheerleader role and saying, hey, you're his number one now. I'm out. I'm done. We love a hands-off mother-in-law in terms of being intrusive. Of course, when they want support, you know, reach out and help them out. But when she's saying, listen, my son is now your husband. Y'all do what y'all got to do to make it work. I, I love that. I do. Ola, <laughs> on the other hand, was kind of put in his place when it came to his interaction with Katina's friends. And... um. The one friend, the male friend, I forget his name, but he was basically saying, don't take marriage lightly, okay? Getting married is a final decision. When you say till death do us part, right. you know what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Cause you're saying like, you're not, you're making it sound it's like you're gravity. just picking up. Yeah, you, right. you make it's it sound like- Gravity, um, serious. I get what you're saying. I really did have an issue with his bull answers. It raises questions about what his intentions are and whether or not he's just on this for attention. That's it. Cause he just seems like he's doing it cause he wants to blow up. Everybody is not gonna let Ola slide with this BS. Like something about him is giving me like, ugh. Are you gonna embarrass me? I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm very scared to, to invest my emotions into this couple, mainly because of him. When they reconvened after the family meetings, he had the audacity to basically say, you have the wrong read on your friends. Because, um, he thought the friend was coming for him, the friend was attacking him, and the friend's opinion was incorrect. And I'm like, this woman holds her friend's opinions to a high regard. And you're gonna speak this way about her? Are you sure this is what you wanna do right now? Okay. So on to the conflicts that happened during the episode. Mark and Lindsay decide to take a separate charter because Lindsay and... Um, Lindsay and Ola had some debacle at the airport where she was saying, um, if you're in these people's native, you're, if you're in their native land, okay, if you're in their native land, speak their native language. And he was saying like, first of all, I'm gonna speak English if I want to, because that's my native language. And both him and Katina were not having it. Don't, don't come near me if you're gonna tell me and what language you speak, that's it. And then when people are walking away, she's gonna say, I wanna fight him. Yeah. You wanna keep her away from me. I'm dead serious, keep her far away from me. Later on, Lindsay is, um, you know, taking a moment for herself. This is at the honeymoon. And she's basically saying, I thought we were joking. And then all of a sudden he got aggressive with me and he was posturing as if he wanted to fight me and she was triggered by the situation and it really brought me to a place where i didn't feel comfortable and it really like shook me at my core so immediately i as a black individual am triggered 
I am. And I don't care who's going to be mad about what I'm about to say. When I hear a white woman speak a certain way about black individuals, I'm immediately inclined to believe the black individual. Just because of history, just because of my personal experience, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that I will side with the white person. Going to be completely transparent about that. However, in this circumstance, I actually don't know who to believe. Reason being, he does come off combative. He was like that with um, Katina. It's Katina, right? Katina's friend. He's showing that he's going to be like that later on in the season in reference to um, Dr. Pepper's coaching. So do I believe that he got aggravated over the situation and maybe played it up? Possibly. Possibly. Then I look at Lindsay. The person who does have a very over-the-top personality. The person who has been exposed to have a sharp tongue. The person who has been exposed to not hearing the word no enough. Do I believe that she could be pushing the narrative and, make, and playing up the situation? Possibly. But again, like I said, when I see a white woman and a black person, I'm inclined to believe the black person, so. We're gonna leave that there. Even though um, I was feeling immaturity from Mark, I really liked how he handled the situation. He allowed his woman to feel seen and heard. He validated her feelings. He did what, you know, he, he let her have time to herself. Yo, take a shower, cool off, chill out. He went to the rest of the people and said, yo, I apologize on behalf of my partner. You know, things didn't have to go that way. But he also didn't diminish his wife in that conversation. He wasn't like, if I'm thinking back of Gil, when Gil was talking about Mirla whenever she wasn't there, he would always put her down. And I didn't like that. But in this case, he's like, oh, you know, like tensions were flaring and, you know, words were said, but it doesn't have to be like that. Let's keep things copacetic. You know, let's just be cordial to one another. And and I I I was very proud of Mark. I was. I can't lie. Um, so yeah, Ola and Katina also agree to keep things copacetic, but when I'm thinking of these large personalities, it's highly unlikely that things are gonna stay that way. In the preview for the next episode, it seems like everybody is going through some kind of adversity. Um, Katina and Lindsay are faced with uh having to deal with each other again. So we'll see how that pans out. Let me know your thoughts on this episode. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.